Genesis chapter 31, and I will continue to expound Genesis chapter 30 since that didn't seem as satisfactory in the explanation of what Jacob did something weird with the sheep and the goats. Genesis 31 and verse 1, And he heard the words of Laban's son, saying, Jacob hath taken away all that was our father's. So Jacob seems to hear a word from Laban's sons who told uh, their dad, Laban, Jacob took away all that belonged to our fathers. So meaning took, took away all the sheep. And of that which was our fathers hath he gotten all this glory. From our father's stuff that he took for himself, he gets all the credit, he gets all the glory, he gets all the riches. Verse 2, And Jacob beheld the countenance of Laban. So Jacob looks at Laban's appearance, his demeanor, his countenance, his facial expression, obviously. And behold, it was not toward him as before. And lo and behold, it's not the same as before where he was happy with Jacob, tried to make a good deal with Jacob, getting along. Wasn't the same as before. Verse 3, And the Lord said unto Jacob, Return unto the land of thy fathers and to thy kindred, and I will be with thee. So the Lord says to Jacob during that time, that moment, it's the right time to basically leave Laban. Go back to the land of your forefathers, where your family comes from, and to your relatives, that's your kindred, your people, and I will be with you. That's basically what he's saying. So again, I'm trying to explain each and every word and phrase in the verse. So make sure you see if my explanation matches up with the verse. Verse 4, And Jacob sent and called Rachel and Leah to the field unto his flock. So Jacob, he uh, summons Rachel and Leah, his wives, out to the field where his flock is at, all the speckled and spotted sheep and rams that he was able to build up for himself. Verse 5, And said unto them, I see your father's countenance, that it is not toward me as before, but the God of my father hath been with me. So Jacob, he says to his wives that uh, the way your dad is looking at me, it's not the same as before when we were getting along. But, you know, the God of my father, the God of my forefathers, my God has always been with me, took care of me. And you know that with all my power, I have served your father. So Jacob claims that, hey, you both know that I have used all my strength and might to serve your dad, to be good to him. And your father hath deceived me and changed my wages ten times. And then he says, in spite of how well I served your dad, he tricked me and he even changed my wages ten times. Now that must be a good boss. But you can see right here that Jacob is reaping what he's sown because he's done the same to his older brother and his family. And remember, like I told you before, ain't it a coincidence that his money is taken away 10 times when originally he made that promise to God that he give a tenth of his earning to the Lord, but he never did that. So I think the Lord's just taking back what belongs to him. Verse 7, the latter part of verse 7, but God suffered him not to hurt me. However, Jacob says, in spite of your uh, father's ill treatment toward me, God would not allow him, would not suffer him to put any harm toward me. If he said thus, the speckled shall be thy wages, then all the cattle bear speckled. And if he said thus, the ring straight shall be thy hire, then bear all the cattle ring straight. So Jacob is saying, if your father said, you know, thus, the idea is, if he said it this way, the speckled sheep, so those that have spots in them, will be your hire. They will be your earning, your wages. So Jacob's earning and wage is not uh, really uh, dollar bills. It's more so dependent upon the cattle. That's how he makes his earning. So Jacob was whining that uh, his, uh, his father-in-law changed that earning ten times. Jacob says that when his father-in-law 
offers to him in this way, the spotted sheep is going to be your earning, then guess what? All the cattle here just uh, gave birth to spotted sheep, and that was my hire. And if he said it this way, that the ring strikes, so those who have uh, ring lines in the cattle will be his pay, then guess what? The cattle give birth to uh, all the babies that are ring straight. Thus God hath taken away the cattle of your father and given them to me. He's claiming that thus, meaning from the previous text, verse 8, you know, when your father said the spot's going to be your wage, guess what? All the flock just gave birth to spotted sheep. And when the father switched it back, you know, was switching back and forth, the ring straight will be your pay. Guess what? All the cattle gave birth to ring straight. So God took away the cattle of your father and gave them to me. That's what he's arguing because he's claiming that God's divine hand was behind the whole thing and changed, you know, the cattle to all of a sudden to a Dalmatian, to a striped tiger or something like that. You know what I mean? So that's what he's claiming. That's what he's claiming. So coincident, that's why, you know, there's no doubt God's hands behind it. That's why I got this increase of cattle. Now, as you know, that is absolutely not true. But surprisingly, some intellectual theologians think that's true. For these brilliant PhDs and DDs and THDs and XYZ people, and they, they should know that Jacob is a, is a con artist and a deceiver, but for some weird reason, they're so smart that they don't see that. And they think, you know what Jacob says is the truth. That's why, that's how God... That's how Jacob was able to have cattle that were spotted ring straight because God's hand was behind it all the way. There's no other possible explanation. There was a divine hand behind it. Even Ken Ham and the creationists made that mistake. Why? Because they prized theologians. Uh, Ken Ham's creationist organization and other creationists hold hands with Calvinists. They all hold hands with each other in the intellectual field for Christians. But they know zero common sense in Bible. Amen. I mean, common sense is Jacob's a con artist. You're going to take him for his word? Apparently, PhD people do, you know. I mean, I wouldn't be surprised. Nowadays, if you throw a PhD guy out on the streets, they don't have street smarts. They'll be conned every time. There's some truth behind there. Anyways, let's continue on Jacob's lie in verse 10. And it came to pass at the time that the cattle conceived... So Jacob's saying, it just so happened to be at that moment when the cattle uh, became pregnant, they were giving birth to babies or the lambs or the calves, that I lifted up mine eyes and saw in a dream. And behold, the oh, okay, here we go, you know. This, this is how you get an agenda. You go, I had a dream. You always do that, and then you can get a following. That's how you deceive people. So Jacob says, you know, I just happened to lift up mine eyes and then all of a sudden, you know, I was looking inside a dream. So he's claiming to be some prophet who's seeing a vision. And behold, the rams which leaped upon the cattle were ring straight, speckled, and gristled. So Jacob's claiming that inside this dream, lo and behold, there just happened to be these rams that leaped on the cattle. So in other words, you can see that uh, these rams are uh, trying to uh, make this cat, these uh, Laban's cattle pregnant, okay? And then Jacob's claiming that these rams just so happen to be ring straight, speckled, and gristled. So Jacob's trying to claim right here, the reason why these cattle gave birth to ring straight, speckled, and grizzled uh, calves or lambs is because it just so happened to be that the Lord sent down these rams who were ring straight, speckled, and grizzled, who, uh, who just happened to have intercourse with Laban's cattle and then produce uh, more cattle that were ring straight, speckled, and grizzled. So, you know, he's really going, he's really stretching things. And the angel of God spake unto me in a dream, saying, Jacob, and I said, here am I. So, 
supposedly uh, an angel from God or maybe the angel of the Lord. It could be either or. He says to Jacob inside this dream, calling out Jacob's name, and Jacob responds, I'm here. Verse 12, and he said, lift up now thine eyes and see all the rams which leap upon the cattle are ring straight, speckled, and gristled. So in this dream, the angel tells Jacob, hey, uh, lift up your eyes and look, all the rams that are uh, leaping on the cattle. So meaning that they're trying to uh, join flesh with flesh, and that way the cattle can conceive that these rams that just happen to leap on Laban's cattle are ring streaks speckled and grizzled. So why would uh, Rachel and Leah believe in a fantastical thing like that? Because Jacob, he is a con artist. So he has to put God in here because it is very hard to believe. If you put God in there, then it would be believable. If you say, I have a dream, it will be believable. You'll have followers. So if you recall in Acts chapter 10, Peter had a dream as well and a vision, and God was able to bring down animals. Why, if God had the power to do that, I'm sure God can do the same thing with Jacob. See, so Jacob's very clever. He's not being stupid here. It does sound stupid, and you would say, who would believe in that? But you know what? Adolf Hitler can be what people would say is stupid too, but he was able to conjure up and deceive whole nation. So you got to realize this. Even if statements sound stupid, you got to realize that uh, sometimes they, people have a hidden agenda and they can deceive people. Yeah. They can deceive people. So Jacob, he's very clever. He knows how to deceive. He knows how to trick people. Now, if we were to examine uh, this passage on how Jacob claims his dream, we know that this is ridiculous because of his history of putting God in his lies. Let's first look at uh, Genesis chapter 27. Genesis chapter 27. Now remember, Isaac, he was tricked by Jacob. Isaac pointed out to Jacob, hey, how'd you find the deer meat so quickly? And Jacob had to come up with an answer very fast. And such a cunning guy came up with this answer so that his dad don't keep critically examining him. He says right here in Genesis chapter 27, and then verse... Uh, verse 20, and Isaac said unto his son, How is it that thou hast found it so quickly, my son? And he said, Because the Lord thy God brought it to me. <laughs> it's like, for example, that you talk to a pastor that's kind of shady, and then uh, you're like asking him, Why are we doing this, pastor? And then the pastor says, You know, I can't tell you, but I prayed about it, and I fasted to the Lord, and this is what the Lord led on my heart. You won't question after that. Yeah. See, now I'm not telling you to be critical and, you know, sometimes we can't nitpick people's businesses. If a person has to say, hey, the Lord just provided for me, you know, the amount the Lord had uh, sustained our church and the Lord has protected us, then that's what it is. OK, but what I'm telling you is this, because statements are like like that are really good. Jacob is going to use that kind of a good statement so that people can believe him. Do you follow? What my point is, Jacob is very smart to make sure people would believe him. So you can see he's a very wicked man. He's very wicked. That's the reason why the Lord rightfully made him reap what he sowed with Laban. So he's whining about, your father-in-law changed my wages ten times. What did you expect out of a deceiver? He was deceiving you. A stressful life is when both deceivers play games on each other and you both deserve each other. Okay, going back here. So we know that Jacob, that he's uh, lying through his teeth, except the PhD and the um, THD theologians because they're so smart that they got conned by Jacob's lie in Genesis 31. And the reason why they have to do that is because Genesis chapter 30 is very hard to resolve. So let's go back to Genesis 30, and I'll explain it. Now, we see right here Laban and his sons, they envy Jacob. So this is them, and then this is Jacob. He's talking to Rachel. While he's talking to Rachel, he's giving this kind of prophecy right here. 
Now let's go to Jacob's mind, though, while he's prophesying, okay? So he knows what's going on here. So how were his cattle able to be ring-straked and spotted? So let's just uh, put spotted. and ring such and such. Now, this is Jacob's pay, remember. Jacob made a deal with Laban. When Laban said, oh, uh, how should I pay you so that I can keep you here longer? And let me know if I'm cut out of bounds. Jacob says, you don't have to pay me at all. Oh, so you can see there's a catch here. All right, you don't have to pay me at all. No, nothing's free money. Nothing's free in life. So, Jacob says, all you have to pay me is that any cattle that is born, that is spotted and ring straked amongst uh, your cattle and flock, that I'll be my pay. And Laban's like, that's a very good deal. Laban is smart too. He's not stupid, all right? But how did Laban get conned? Because Jacob pulled up an incredibly witty plan. Laban, he was the one who locked up all the ring-straked and spotted cattle. So he took all of that. So remember, we're starting out, okay? Pretend Jacob's going to launch his plan. I'm going to get ring-straked and spotted cattle. And Laban's like, okay. But Laban, to make sure Jacob doesn't have the flock giving birth ring straight and spotted as much, he's going to keep them all to himself and lock them up. So he locks them all up. So then Jacob, all he has right now, so let's go to here now. So Jacob's first flock is solid color now, right? So there's no spotted, there's no speckle. <coughs> Not only that, during that time, the shepherds, they favored their flock and their cattle to be a solid color. Not, uh, no dots, you know, no ring strike, no markings. So Jacob, he makes a good deal with Laban. I'll get all the spotted and the cattle that has markings on it. You can have the solid color. So Laban's like, that's a very good idea. I don't have any problems with that. Now, there's another thing. Another thing is these, uh, this kind of cattle is rare to come out. This kind of cattle is rare to come out. What's more common is the solid color. Solid color is more common. Now, if you have a solid color cattle, what's going to happen is once in a while, you're going to get a spotted and ring straight coming out as well, or a certain cattle or sheep that's going to have certain markings on it. But most of the cattle, most of the cattle born from solid colors will be solid. All right, does that sound easy so far? Okay, so that's what's going on. So we see right here, that this is the dominant gene, solid colors. So we understand what that means, right? In other words, that the cattle that is going to be born from solid color is going to be solid color mainly, all right? So that's what we mean by dominant. It's going to be the dominant one. That's the genetics that's going to be most dominant. The one that's going to be less or it's going to be the least is what we call the, I think we call it recessive gene right here, all right? The ring straight and spotted are the recessive gene. So they're going to be the ones that are co coming out less. Now, Lab so Laban doesn't see a problem. He's like, sure, you can have the spotted and ring straight. Why? Because they're going to be the smaller ones. They're going to be the smaller amount. And Laban's solid color would be the bigger amount, 
which means Laban should have more money than Jacob then, right? The person who has the largest flock will be the richer one. Do we follow so far? Is that easy so far? Yeah. Okay, so we follow so far. But Laban makes Jacob's chances even smaller by taking all the spotted and ring straight for himself. He locks them all up at the beginning. So all Jacob has for his first flock is all he has is solid colors. So Laban realizes that, okay, this should be foolproof now that Jacob's spotted ring straight flock will be much smaller than my solid colors. Do you follow so far? So that's why the theologians are baffled here. So they're like, well, how is Jacob going to get ring straight and spotted? Jacob must be right then. God somehow, you know, put that ring straight speckled ram to leap upon this flock and that way spotted and ring straight can come out. That's the only logical explanation. God put a divine hand where somehow the cattle gave birth to ring straight and spotted. That's a sign of laziness, actually, because that does sound like a right interpret. That sounds like an easier way to resolve the passage. But if you know Jacob's personality and history, he's a con artist, so that don't work. So you can't go by that interpretation. It's, it's, it doesn't make sense. There's no doubt Jacob knew. Jacob knew what he was doing, and he wanted to deceive Laban, and he somehow figured out a way to outnumber Laban's flock. So how did he do that? Well, you know, I am not a shepherd, one. And number two, I don't, uh, I don't have a PhD on genetics. But even this fool right here could figure it out. And I don't know why these PhD creationists and theologians couldn't figure, them out, uh, couldn't figure it out for themselves. And I didn't even use Hebrew and Greek. So what, do we, what am I? I'm just a person who believes every word in that King James Bible to be perfect, which is why I don't play around with historical, scientific sources with Hebrew and Greek and will resolve the passage. Read the verse as it says. Amen. Now, why do I make fun of them so hard on that? Because that's why you should be King James only. Do you realize that? That's why you should realize we must have a perfect Bible with every word being perfect. If you don't believe in that, you're going to come up with ridiculous interpretations. But if you believe God, what he says, not what you think. If you believe what God says, and rather than believing what you think to be logical, then God will resolve the passage every time. Amen. Now, let's look at that right here in Genesis chapter 30. Notice right here that verse 34 and 35, that's true. Laban removes the spotted and uh, ring-straked goats from Jacob. He removes it. So Jacob, all he has is a solid colored flock. Okay? Do we follow so far? Yeah. All right. Now, Jacob, what are you going to do? Okay? You're fr so we're right here. We're right here right now. So Jacob, what are you going to do? All you have is solid color. How are you going to have ring, uh, ring straight and spotted? And how are you going to have that outnumber Laban's? Well, this is what Jacob did at verse 37. And Jacob took him rods of green poplar and of the hazel and chestnut tree and peeled white strakes in them and made the white appear which was in the rods. And he set the rods which he had peeled before the flocks in the gutters in the watering troughs when the flocks came to drink that they should conceive when they came to drink. Now, remember what I taught you last time. No, this is not what atheists are saying that somehow, uh, you know, Jacob was... Uh, Draw, uh, making the rods like ring straight, you know, making markings so that when the cattle saw that, that all of a sudden they gave birth to ring straight uh, lambs and calves. No, that's not what it means. That's why atheists use that passage to poke fun at the Bible. J that's not Jacob's intention. As I've taught you last time, and scientists have discovered this, when you eat, uh, when you put, excuse me, when you have your cattle or sheep eating poplar, and then especially with uh, some of the bark, you know, peeled off and the white showing, then it has the nutrients where it, where it increases fertility. But Jacob's not done. Hazel and chestnut as well. 
And hazel and chestnut, as I've told you before, it has health benefits. And if you put them in water, even more so. The, the nutrients for your health, as well as fertility increases for the sheep. So Jacob deliberately did this so that they can conceive when they drank that. Sometimes they'll eat the whole, uh, they'll eat the whole stick as well. They'll eat the whole rod as well. So the chances of fertility increased at verse 39. And the flocks conceived before the rods and brought forth cattle, ring straight, speckled, and spotted. So when the flocks came and then they ate that up and drank it, they were able to give birth to ring straight, speckled, and spotted. Now notice what I said right there. Notice how I said it as they were able to give birth to ring straight, speckled, and spotted. The verse did not say they gave birth only to ring straight, speckled, and spotted. Now, why is that important? Because this is where the scholars, because they don't take every word literally as it says and make sure every word is important. That's why they missed it out. I take every word as important. Because the word only is not there, that makes a huge difference. Okay, returning back. His tactic, okay, it's solid color. So this is Jacob's order, how he does it. One, I got to make them produce a lot of lambs and calves. I got to make them produce a lot of babies, okay? So fertility. That's a no-brainer, right? But then here's the issue. The issue is, well, if they give birth to a lot of lambs and calves, then you're just going to produce a lot of solid colors. True, but here's the idea. Like I told you before, solid color sheep, when they give birth, once in a while, they'll give birth to spotted and ring straight, right? Okay, but if the solid color give birth to a lot of lambs and calves, a lot of babies, then this is not going to be once in a while. This is going to be more frequent coming out. You see that? So it is true when we go right here, fertility, but then it leads down to that solid colors are born, and, but that doesn't mean that uh, spotted are not born. Spotted are born. Right. Now look at this. Is, solid is still greater than spotted. You can't deny that one, all right? Because that's, part of, that's just genetics. That's dominant gene versus recessive gene. That's why you notice right here, that's why theologians are trying to argue about putting God's hand on that. Because they realize that the dominant gene is solid, so then God had to switch it where this becomes the dominant. That's the idea in their minds. But God's hand is not in this. This is all Jacob's doing. The proof text is Genesis 31. They didn't read the verse. Go to Genesis 31. After Jacob gave that weird little dream on how he got his cattle outnumbering Laban's, notice what the Bible says. The Bible says in verse 18, in verse 18, and he carried away all his cattle. So Jacob carries away all his cattle and all his goods, which the Lord gave him, which he had gotten. The, cat, the Holy Spirit specifies again the cattle of his getting. Yeah, right. See, it was all Jacob's doing. Where, where were the scholars on that one? I thought that context is so important for biblical hermeneutics. Where were they? Okay, go back to Genesis 30 again. Genesis 30 again. Yeah, I'll get them, brother. Yeah, I have zero respect for scholars. Genesis chapter 30. Now, we see right here that verse 39, that's where we left off. He was able to have the cattle give birth to spotted, okay? But solid will still outnumber spotted, we know that. But how are you going to get this to increase more if they're more fertile? So see, that's why he has to increase their fertility so that this thing can increase. This will increase too, but at least he gets more numbers on this, okay? So Jacob's plan is step by step. This is very clever. 
So remember this, increase fertility, this will increase. We follow so far. But it won't change the fact when you look at this board, solid will still outnumber spotted, okay? I don't know if you remember basic math or this, what this symbol means, but that's what it means, okay? <laughs> All right. Now, how is he going to out now? How is he going to outnumber Laban's solid color flock? He's going to have to have the spotted outnumber solid. How are you going to switch that, right? How you switch that is basic, uh, basic cattle raising breeding tactics. What shepherds and uh, cattle herders do is that if you, uh, if you have a certain color or breed of cattle, you can change it, they said. You can change the color, you can change the breed. How do you do that? All you have to do is weed out uh, the color or brand that you don't like and make sure that the color and brand that you do like increase more. Well, doll, why didn't any PhD Christian scholar thought of that? Because verse 39 messed them up. That's why. They don't believe every word to be perfect. That verse simply said, the fl Laban's flock gave birth to ring straight spotted. That's all it said. Isn't it true that Jacob's first flock that was solid color, when they became fertile, they gave birth to spotted ring straight? Of course. It didn't say only spotted and ring straight. Yeah. It just said they gave birth to spotted and ring straight. Just uh, read the verse. They don't read the verse. But if you doubt me, look at verse 40. It specified. The verse specified right here that it's not only ring straight and spotted because Jacob had to separate he had to separate the speckled lambs from the spotted lambs. Verse 40, and Jacob did what? Separate the what? Lambs. You know what lambs is? Baby sheep. The babies that were born, he, as soon as they were born, as soon as the first flock gave birth to the babes, then he separated them. Why? Because... He realized it's not only spotted, wrestled, and ring straight. Both of these are being born. That's just common sense genetics. Common sense when you've dealt with breeding and shepherding, etc. So he weeds them out. See that? So he separates them. Separation. And then I'll just put right here, not, uh, I'm putting layman's term, okay? So weeding out. That way it'll be more simple for you to understand. So that's what he's trying to do. He's trying to uh, separate and then weed them out. He's going to make sure that the solid color is going to be weeded out and shrink. And then he's going to uh, have the spotted ones increase. It's uh, Okay, just keep reading. L notice I'm going literally word for word in sequence in order here from the King James Bible text. Amen. And that's all you need. The next part of verse 40. And set the faces of the flocks toward, what, the solid color? No, toward the ring straight and all the brown in the flock of Laban. I told you so. See, he's trying to set Laban's flock now to concentrate on what? This. He's trying to increase that. There's no doubt. He's weeding it out. He's weeding it out. Keep reading. And he put his own flocks by themselves and put them not unto Laban's cattle. Look at that. Jacob's, <laughs> Jacob's so clever. He's, he said, he makes sure that Laban's cattle, okay, which is all solid color, right? They're going to concentrate on this one. And then Jacob's flock that come out spotted, he's going to say, no, you're not going to taint yourselves with the solid color. Get away from that. Right. See, I told you so. He's weeding it out. Smart. Clever guy. Notice in verse 41. Now notice 41 is not the same as 38. The scholars think they're both the same. No, there's something different that happens at 41. Yeah. And it came to pass whensoever the what? Stronger cattle did conceive. That's different from verse 38. 38 is the first flock, the cattle. But this time at verse 41, Jacob's going to make sure stronger cattle are the ones 
who are going to drink out of that trowel and become more fertile, and the weaker ones don't. Well, th that's just common sense. Who do you, whose cattle do you think is stronger, Jacob or Laban's? It's Jacob's. So Jacob's stronger cattle are obviously what? The spotted or the solid? It's the spotted. So Jacob's spotted strong, uh, or stronger cattle, in verse 41, did conceive when they gave birth. Jacob laid the rod before the eyes of the cattle in the gutters that they might conceive among the rods. He made sure, okay, you keep eating up those rods, you stronger spotted cattle, you. All right? Now, this is apparent that the stronger is referring to Jacob spotted because if you look at verse 42, the stronger is Jacob's, right? The weaker is Laban, right? Okay, so the stronger cattle is referring to Jacob's spotted cattle, okay? Can we agree so far? So Jacob's spotted cattle, and then the weaker... is Laban's solid cattle. Ah, all right, hopefully that's readable. Anyways, let's go back to, uh, so 41, I explained that. So Jacob's trying to make sure that his spotted cattle keep becoming more fertile, fertile, and eating up the rods. So what's going to happen then? The spotted will increase, definitely become more fertile. Uh, and then verse 42, but when the cattle were feeble, so whose cattle is that? Obviously Laban's, right? He put them not in. He makes sure Laban's cattle don't eat up the rods, poplar. At the beginning, he did. Why? Because he had to get spotted coming out. But this time, he's saying, no, 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 you don't this time. Why? He's going to have... He, this guy, you talk about an elitist rich Jew who's doing population control over the world. There is some truth to that, all right? That don't just come out of thin air, all right? Something that is inherited. So you talk about something like that, that was from Jacob. That was from Jacob. You talk about doing that kind of stuff. So that's why Gentiles like Laban get jealous at Jews and accuse them for every evil in the world. There's a lot of truth in this passage. I've given you a lot of nuggets. Okay. But nevertheless, God's blessing at hand was still on Jacob. God's blessing at hand is still on the Jewish people because of his promise. Why? Because God's hand and blessing can go on anybody. It doesn't matter. And that specific person will mess up in his or her sin and abuse God's blessing. That's an indisputable fact, okay? So before you get uh, judgmental on, uh, on the Jewish people, you should look at yourself, huh? Yeah. Anyways, verse 42, let's keep reading. Uh, but when the cattle were feeble, he put them not in. So the feebler were Laban's and the stronger Jacob's. And the man increased exceedingly and had much cattle. So that's why Jacob's cattle increased and outnumbered. Labans. Now, is, notice right here, I never used Hebrew and Greek. Did you notice that right there? I took every word as it said, because every word is important. Separate the lambs. Set the face of the flock toward the ring straight. Spotted. The distinction of the wording in verse, uh, uh, excuse me, the distinction of the uh, wording of verse 38 and 41, there's a di difference of a scenario going on there. Why? You just read every word as it says. And you're going to take your chances with a modern Bible version, with Christian scholarship, yeah. because they have PhDs. Notice how they messed up so bad. Yeah. Why? Because they believe in their own wisdom rather than what God actually said in his book. That's why you have to be KJV only, no doubt. Why? Because a perfect Bible with every word being perfect is important. There's differences of words or uh, mistakes within words that justifies a multitude of various versions. Then you have no authority to stand upon to build up a doctrine or a teaching. 
Notice how I was able to give you this wonderful teaching that should be just basic common sense because of abiding by the word of God. Okay? All right, now go back right here. This is not stated out of arrogance, but it is stated so that as to convince people to believe only the King James Bible and to believe a perfect Bible. All right, going back to Genesis 31. Genesis 31. Now we know right here that this is all Jacob's doing. And then if we look at verse 11 through 12, as I have commented to you, I don't think I explained the last part of verse 12, so let me explain that part. For I have seen all that Laban doeth unto thee. So the angels supposedly tells Jacob in the dream that, hey, you know, uh, my hand was behind it, and somehow rams that were ring streaked, speckled, spotted, just intermingled with Laban's cattle and gave birth to ring streaked, speckled, and spotted. I did that for you because I saw everything of how Laban treated you maliciously. Yeah, sure. So Jacob right here, notice he puts God in the picture right here, and he gives a statement that has truth in there, but it's combined with a lie. Yep. Now, isn't it true that, uh, what did God say? Look at directly what God said at verse 3. Verse 3 is, go back to your home. Yeah. It's that simple. But Jacob, uh, he used an amplified Bible <laughs> because he had a lot of, he had a lot to say yeah. more than God. Right. Just like the scholars who write your Bibles. And they have a lot more to say than God does. And they will say that, you know, a long, long time ago, your dad changed my wages 10 times. And God's like, I never told you to say that. <laughs> God took away the cattle of your father. And, you know, God gave me a dream. And God's like, you're really stretching things now. You're basically lying. Now, who did that? Genesis 3. Yeah. Who did that? Yeah. Apparently, people have a problem with hearing and believing what God says. Yep. And following to the letter what God says. Look at our day and age today. They have a problem with hearing and believing what God says in his book. So they have a hard time following what God says. They don't even follow. They just make up their own following. They follow their own ways of adding words and subtracting words. Their own way of doing things. Why? Because scholarship took away their Christianity. They're not Christian scholarship. My foot. Look at Genesis chapter 3. And then we'll uh, read verse 2 through 3. You know this passage. Remember what God told Eve about the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Notice that Eve said, And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden... God has said, ye shall not eat of it, neither, what, shall ye touch it. Now, God never said that right there. She was adding to God's statement that you cannot touch it. But it's the truth that God said, you know, don't eat the fruit out of the tree. It's the truth. So that's what Jacob did. He was adding to God's word. Now, this is important. Go to Deuteronomy 13. Deuteronomy 13. Do you realize that Jacob had the gift of prophecy? Did you forget our previous commentary in Genesis? Abraham was a prophet, remember? That's why uh, the king of the Philistines asked Abraham to pray for him because he's a prophet. Isaac is a prophet too because he predicted the future of God's blessing upon Jacob and even Esau as well. That future prophecies showed fulfillment. So why? Because... Remember, the blessing, the Abrahamic blessing, was the gift of prophecy, as I've showed you, that Esau lost. So Jacob inherited that. So he has the gift, the power of prophecy. And notice how he abused that. If he was born during the Old Testament law, do you know what would have happened to him? He'd be killed. Because a prophet is supposed to state from God, if he has a dream from God or a word from God, he has to state it correctly. If you don't, you get stoned to death. Yeah. Now look at Deuteronomy 13. If there arise among you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams and give it thee a sign or a wonder, Jacob, right? Notice in verse 5, 
And that prophet or that dreamer of dreams shall be put to death because he has spoken to turn you away from the Lord your God. See, God takes it seriously. Go to Deuteronomy 18. Deuteronomy 18. Notice it's not just a prophet or dreamer of dreams who claims to have a word from false gods, but even the God himself. God takes it seriously. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 18. Notice in verse 20. But if a prophet, but the prophet, excuse me, but the prophet which shall presume to speak a word in my name, which what? I have not commanded him to speak. See, Jacob was adding things to what God spoke. Yep. God didn't command him to say that. Or that shall speak in the name of other gods, even that prophet shall what? Die. Die. Go back. Go back. Makes you wonder why God had to make Jacob a cripple for life. Go back to Genesis 31. Genesis 31. All right, so God takes that extremely seriously. We'll look at verse 13. I am the God of Bethel, where thou anointest the pillar, and where thou vowest a vow unto me. Now arise, get thee out from this land, and return unto the land of thy kindred. So here we see a little bit more truth. This is probably 90% and maybe 100% truth, verse 13. God is telling Jacob, I'm the God of Bethel. Why? Because Bethel was where Jacob finally got his awakening and recognized his God, right? God says, I'm the God at Bethel, don't forget, where you anointed that pillar and where you made the vow to me. Now get up, so arise means to get up, get up and... Make sure you get out of this land and return to the land of your family, your relatives, your people. This is a sermon right here. You can do a sermon on Genesis 31. Isn't it amazing? Jacob talked about, God told me about that vow that I made to him. What's the vow, Jacob? You'd give a tenth of what you gave to God. But you didn't. And at the same time, Jacob was whining at verse 7, your father changed my wages 10 times. You know what that's, uh, you know what my point is right here? My point is, notice that Jacob, he said, I'll give a tenth of all that I have to you, God. But he didn't. So God had to make him reap what he sowed through Laban, where Laban did that tenth, right. 10 times changing of his money. Yeah. Because Jacob didn't give that to God. Right. And it's so weird that Jacob remembered that and said that at verse 13, but he's so blind to see the reaping and sowing at verse 7. Yeah. You know what that's an evidence of? Of you Bible believers saying all this kind of stuff, you know, God's going to judge you for this, God's going to do that to you, and, God, and you're preaching, and then you're preaching against sin, and you have, and then you're whining about the trial you're going through, and you have no idea about the reaping and sowing and that you're basically talking about God's judgment on yourself. That's a, that's a sermon right there. That, that's convicting right there. The tendency of people is always to think of so-and-so rather than themselves. And even in their own preaching too. Sometimes you can say a lot of spiritual stuff to people, but sometimes you don't seriously ponder on your spiritual statements and wonder if... You're talking about yourself who needs to work on it. All right, that's a sermon. Anyways, verse 13, Bible study, not preaching. <laughs> Jacob, when he gave that statement on what God says to return to his land, to leave the land of Laban, we see a picture right here. So notice the separation. The separation here with Laban and his sons, they envy Jacob. And then Jacob, he talks to Rachel right here, but there's a separation. God wants Jacob to separate from Laban and to go back to his homeland. In this side of the separation border right here, it's a picture of Laban and his sons being Gentiles. They envy the Jews. Why? Because the Jews are the ones who do that population control. The Jews are the ones that are cunning and that are wicked and steal all our money. And that's a picture of the Gentiles. And they're the ones who, what, the Jews are under the captivity and exile of. Right now, the Jews, right now, they're under the captivity and the exile of United Nations themselves. And the Gentile nations are the ones in control. And guess what? I mean, 
Whether you believe in conspiracy or not, it doesn't change the fact, liberal or conservative, people do not like Jews. I'm sorry, you know, that's the thing that I notice within people. Liberal nations, they don't like the nation of Israel. Uh, the conservatives, they all blame everything on the Jews for evil. People don't like Jews. Why? That's a Gentile envy. That's why that anti-Semitism easily comes out within the Gentiles, Anti which I am not, okay? And I don't believe in that. That's evil. That's wrong. But that's a natural reaction from natural human nature right here. Gentiles, they envy the Jews because they see all the evils that the Jews do. And that's totally unfair. And why is God fa playing favorites with that person? That's just totally wrong. So that's a picture of the Gentiles where they put those Jews under such exile and captivity. And so Jacob, the Jew, was under that exile and captivity. But God says to that Jew, go back to your homeland. So the, that's a picture right here of the Jews returning to their homeland, leaving their exile and captivity. And actually, you notice right here, this is where the Jews are set straight and right with God. During their exile and captivity, they're reaping what they're sowing, and they still mess up in their sin. But when God does restoration, and as they return home in fullness, then they're set straight with God. So we'll see a couple passages. Go to Ezekiel 39. Am I cut off? Go to Ezekiel 39. And I want you to go to Romans 9. We'll go to Ezekiel 39. And then we'll go to Romans 9. We'll go to Ezekiel 39. And then we'll go to Romans 9. Whether Jew or Gentile, it doesn't matter. I do not condone or support people who have uh, evil whims or workings. Notice that God didn't do the same with Jacob either. Okay? God didn't support him either. He made sure that he reaped what he sown. If you read about the history of the Jewish people, you talk about how God took care of them, how God disciplined his children. And you ain't seen nothing yet. In the future tribulation, it gets worse for them. All right? So, no, the Lord knows how to take care of uh, people who commit evil. No, I don't support people who commit evil. But uh, here's the one thing. I let God handle that. God knows what he's doing it. We're going to look at uh, Ezekiel 39. Notice that God says in verse 25, Therefore thus saith the Lord God, now will I bring again the captivity of who? Jacob. Isn't that interesting? Jacob perfectly pictures Israel here. So back in Genesis 31, Jacob truly does picture Israel. Jacob, and have mercy upon the whole house of Israel, and will be for my holy name, after that they have borne their shame and all their trespasses whereby they have trespassed against me, when they dwelt safely in their land and none made them afraid. See, I told you so. God makes them reap what they sow. They suffer for their evil. 27, when I have brought them again from the people and gathered them out of their enemies' lands and am sanctified in, in them in the sight of many nations, then shall they know that I am the Lord their God, which caused them to be led into captivity among the heathen, but I have gathered them unto their own land. So notice right here, God uh, takes, frees them from their exile captivity in the land of Gentiles and puts them back into their own land. We see Jews getting back to their own land, but they don't have it fully yet, right? They talk about two-state solution. Why do you think it's still there? It's still there for a reason. Still there for a reason. The king of kings and the Lord of lords didn't come yet. Even if they have the whole nation, they can't have it in fullness with God's blessing until their Messiah comes down and sets it all straight. They have to suffer. They have to reap the consequences of their sins as a nation first. And they're not done yet. They went through a lot. So to be honest, there shouldn't be envy toward the Jewish people. There shouldn't be envy. Go to Romans 9, Romans 9. And then we'll look at verse 3 through 4, 3 through 4. Notice that the Jews, they still have the blessings of Abraham in prosperity. So notice the picture right here that the Jews, 
while they're under captivity of the Gentiles, they're still being very prosperous. And a lot of times, yes, they use their own sin and their own wits to get their own ways of doing things. But God won't take back his word to the Jews. They're still very prosperous. Look at Romans chapter 9 and verse 3. For I could wish that myself were cursed from Christ for my who? Brethren. brethren. Paul's talking about his Jewish people. My kinsmen according to the flesh. So he's talking about physical Jews in the flesh, not spiritual Christian Jews. No, that don't make sense. Verse 4, who are what? Israelites, to whom pertaineth the adoption and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and the service of God and the promises. See, the Jews still have that. They still have that. All right, let's go back. Let's go back. Now, like I mentioned to you before, is that God did a temporarily casting off of the Jewish people. But one, as I mentioned to you before, it's a temporary and a partial thing. Yep, yep, yep. Still deep down, they still retain the promises in some way or form. Yep. That's important to understand. Why? Why is, there that, uh, why is there that both sides? Because God has to judge them. That's why. Yep. He has to judge them. Go to Genesis 31. And then we will continue on verse 14 next time. All right, so we'll do verse 14 next time. So we didn't get to Rachel's case right here, but in Rachel's case right here, she has a thing about images. And we wonder why she steals her father's images. You can see one right here, it's like getting back at him, so vengeance. But then the second factor is very interesting, which I showed you before that you can't forget her nature. Mm, what's the best word? Let's put... Uh, This is her fleshly nature that she never left. And I'm going to give you verses to recall back in the past that she still had that problem. So she still carried on that problem in Genesis 31 too. So I'll show you verses context by that one. So we'll see what Rachel was thinking when Jacob was talking to her next time. And then the images, that's the first mention. You know that? First mention. Then they didn't have it at Noah's flood, it makes you wonder. Then what was going on? Why did they have images? It has to do with those sons of God. We'll, go, we'll cover that in our Genesis, next Genesis study, and I'll explain that. It's very interesting. Amen. Yeah. Father God, I pray that you'll bless today's teachings, that they will be studied, learned, applied, and practiced upon for your glory. And uh, help us to get a better understanding of that book so that we can read it more into it ourselves. Believing every word to be perfect and not putting our own understanding, but yours. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.